You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and I have uh, Philip Deschamps. He's the uh, CEO of Helios Medical. The website is Helios Medical, H-E-L-I-U-S Medical. And we're talking about uh, portable neurostimulation. So, Phil, thanks for coming. It's uh, my pleasure, Richard. Uh, nice to be on uh, on the phone with you. Yeah. So, what is um, what does portable neurostimulation mean? What, how would you want to stimulate yourself, and for what purposes? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's actually uh, called uh, PONS, so P-O-N-S, uh, which is Portable Neuromodulation Stimulator. Uh, that's actually what the uh, the device does, but you're absolutely correct in saying that this is ultimately about neuromodulation. So neuromodulation is external stimu- stimulation of the brain, uh, and uh, and we'll also uh, we'll discuss a term called neuroplasticity. Uh, which is actually uh, the ability of your brain to uh, modify itself, uh, to potentially uh, change itself, to improve itself, to heal itself. Um, and uh, those are the two uh, neurosystems that are at play here. Okay. So is this more for people that have disease or dysfunction, or is it for people that want to improve their ability to think and you know their functioning capability? Well, the one we know about so far is it seems to help people uh, relieve neurological symptoms of disease or trauma. So uh, what, uh, what's been done so far is uh, the PONS has been developed as a medical device. Uh, and uh, and uh, essentially, we've, uh, we've done uh, clinical trials, uh, and, uh, and uh, the primary uh, first indication is that, uh, that we're seeking from FDA and uh, we're already cleared in Canada for is called a balance, chronic balance deficit from a mild to moderate traumatic brain injury or concussion or sports concussive injuries or anything like that. So that's the first, uh, the first indication, um, and uh, uh, we hope over time uh, to uh, to be cleared for many more things uh, like uh, uh, MS and Parkinson's and stroke uh, and cerebral palsy and things like that. Uh, but uh, from here, uh, for the time being, those are completely experimental uh, 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 potential indications. So what happens when you get a traumatic brain injury? Uh, when it affects your balance chronically, what do you are you literally unable to maintain? Your balance. I mean, how bad does it get, and what does it look like and feel like? Sure. Uh, so, uh, when the people have any kind of a neurological issue, uh, so like MS and Parkinson's, the most common symptom is uh, a balance disorder. Now, whether it becomes chronic or not is really dependent, especially on the traumatic brain injury side, is really dependent on your own body and brain chemistry. So, here's how the numbers work. Um, if you've had a uh, if you've had a traumatic brain injury or a concussion or uh, you know any kind of a bonk to the head, which can include you know falls, bar fights, any any kinds of things like that, uh, you have about a two thirds chance of uh, recovering if it's a mild to moderate of recovering uh, without doing anything, and that typically happens over a uh, you know three to six month period. Um, but unfortunately, about a third of us uh, who have that uh, that injury. Uh, will uh, will actually have chronic symptoms. And unfortunately, when those chronic symptoms set in, uh, they usually set in for life. And of the people who have chronic symptoms, about 40% of them uh, have balance disorder as their primary symptom. So that's how the sort of the cascade of risk goes down for someone who's been uh, traumatically brain injured. So if we want to relate that to real uh, U.S. numbers, uh, there's, a, there's about uh, 5 million people in the U.S. Uh, that have 
uh, chronic symptoms of a traumatic brain injury. Uh, so that's the sort of the macro number, and that results roughly from 15 million uh, blows to the head uh, around uh, in the country. But those who have chronic disorders is about five uh, five million people, and as I said, 30 to 40 percent of those uh, have uh, a, a chronic balance disorder. So that means between 1.5 and 2 million people in the U.S. have this specific diagnosis. Uh, we don't hear a lot about it because there's never really been a treatment for it. Uh, so uh, it's a little like, uh, you know, uh, erectile dysfunction or ED, and nobody really knew about it until Viagra came out and there was something to treat it. Uh, and uh, and so we're a little bit in that situation. Certainly, everybody's heard about uh, uh, concussions and sports concussive injuries sort of made famous by the NFL and their, uh, the monitoring of all of that. Right. But sort of uh, run-of-the-mill kind of, uh, of uh, traumatic brain injuries or, or concussions, uh, people have sort of uh, chucked it up to, yeah, I got my bell rung, but that, that's okay. Uh, but unfortunately, many of those actually uh, last a long time. So how people feel when they have a, a chronic balance deficit is uh, when you can't balance, uh, you struggle to walk. Uh, and you, uh, for example, you start to avoid uh, places where there's a lot of people because you know you're going to have to sort of dodge those people. So it causes uh, social isolation, uh, and uh, and then it uh, diminishes uh, your capacity to earn because there's uh, not a lot of uh, a lot of people can't do the same job that they did before. It doesn't mean that they don't uh, lose their work at all, but uh, but many uh, can't continue to do the the exact same work, and all the way to to uh, full disability. Uh, where uh, you're not able to uh, to uh, uh, to work or uh, or even sort of participate in society in the uh, in the way that uh, we would traditionally do. In fact, many many people get prescribed um, uh, occupational therapy, which basically means uh, how do you learn to live with your disorder? Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. So the, the therapy is not to improve function, but just how to live with it. I mean, why not try yeah, to improve well, people's function? Yeah. No, you're exactly right. Uh, so uh, the standard of care today uh, without pawns is to simply do physical therapy. And, uh, and physical therapy, uh, certainly traumatic brain injuries have been around for millions of years. <laughs> and physical therapy has been around for probably 100 years. Uh, and so the, the physical therapy community and the literature that sort of uh, understands the relationship between its effectiveness in treating traumatic brain injury or TBI or balance disorder uh, is very, very well known. And typically what happens is, yes, you do improve a little bit, uh, but after you stop doing the exercises, you tend to drift back to your original level of disability. Uh, and so that has become so well known that insurance companies and even physicians don't even prescribe the physical therapy because they know it's essentially a, a Band-Aid for a little while. Uh, that then uh, people, uh, you know, sort of uh, drift back in, in some way uh, for, for some well, people, one, of course. One, one, one quick question. Why would you drift sure. back? I mean, I thought by doing physical therapy, you're uh, training your brain to act in a certain way or to move in a certain way or to, you know, connect this motion to this part of your brain. Why wouldn't that become ingrained with practice, just like practicing basketball or something? Yeah, you're you're. It's a very astute uh, question. So you're exactly right. Uh, the problem is that your your um, uh, the uh, the balance center of your body, unlike a muscle or somebody that you're rehabilitating, uh, you know, from a, a hip injury or a knee injury or an ankle injury, uh, that uh, that uh, rehabilitation has to affect your brain. And thus far. Uh, it's never been demonstrated that your brain actually changes uh, through physical therapy. So what happens is you, as you just uh, pointed out, you learn uh, to balance better and you practice to balance better. Uh, but when and if, and if you kept, kept up with that practice, you would maintain a certain level of performance. Uh, but what the literature would say and clinical experience says is when you stop doing those exercises, you tend to sort of drift back to your original level because there's no change in your brain. And that's what uh, Pons seems to be able to uh, to uh, procure uh, when you combine that physical therapy that we were just talking about to neuromodulation. It seems to put the brain into a plastic state 
that in fact allows the brain to change itself and follow different pathways and bypass the areas that's been damaged by the disease or the trauma in this case uh, to make permanent changes to the brain uh, that seems to uh, then sustain over time uh, and uh, and essentially uh, restore uh, the balance of people. So that that seems to be the difference. And I, I'm speaking of this, uh, Richard, as if I'm a, a, a you know a perfect authority and science knows exactly what I'm, I'm talking about. That's the conjecture around this. That's what we see clinically um, and uh, in the research that we've done. But uh, to tell you that we understand exactly what mechanism uh, this ultimately works in uh, would be a stretch. Okay, but um, when you design the device, yep. are you first going for a state? You know, you, do you want to put a person to a state where they do have neuroplasticity and then just, it just so happens that the particular skill you're going to have them work on will benefit them? Because if you yeah, figure out how to put the brain into a, a neuroplastic state, that opens up the door to learn anything or to facilitate learning in anything. Yeah, they, well, you know, that's the ultimate, uh, you know, macro promise of this kind of technology. Uh, but uh, in uh, in the medical world, uh, you can only make those statements when you actually test them in prospective uh, randomized clinical trials. And so thus far, we've done a clinical trial or two clinical trials in traumatic brain injury where exactly what you said seems to be uh, the outcome. So we've been able to take people in our clinical trials uh, from a pretty profound uh, disability with respect to balance uh, with a prognosis of a lifetime of that disability and on average make those people uh, go into the normal range of balance uh, over the 14-week program. And so that's what we've tested and we can categorically say we've also done some work in, uh, in multiple sclerosis and some work in stroke and some work in cerebral palsy in much smaller studies, but they've demonstrated the same thing. So each time we, uh, we make a statement uh, like that, uh, we, uh, we have to have the backup in science to be able to prove the statement. And we hope Thanks. certainly... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we hope certainly that uh, someday that it might help people think better, um, uh, make uh, uh, you know human performance uh, better, make athletes better. Uh, but we simply don't uh, don't know that scientifically yet. Well, what do you know about the activation of neuroplasticity? How do you? What are the suggested models for how it happens and what causes it to happen? So the best uh, the best uh, evidence that we have uh, today, and it's actually evidence that was generated completely independently of of our company, uh, and uh, it was done by uh, three uh, or two major uh, neuro research centers. And they actually did uh, animal models that pointed at uh, that uh, uh, because they they were curious, and this is uh, this is going to sound like a, a real stretch, but it, they were curious as to why mammals, some mammals are able to dive uh, to thousands of feet uh, in the ocean and not have a stroke uh, through the pressure. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's known as the diving reflex. And the diving reflex, uh, you know, both the cold water and the pressure affect a nerve called the trigeminal nerve. And the trigeminal nerve goes from your tongue uh, directly to the back of the brain and has a big imprint on your brain. So the idea that they had was, what if we stimulated uh, electrically that uh, that uh, trigeminal nerve and see what uh, happens in a traumatic brain injury model? So that work was done by the Feinstein Institute uh, in uh, in Long Island, and it basically showed that uh, when you stimulate the uh, the trigeminal nerve, it increases blood flow to the area that was uh, that was damaged, and uh, and so that is potentially one of the mechanisms by which. Uh, the brain puts itself into a plastic state and that the area of the brain that's been damaged receives more blood, thus is able to make better connections uh, through the uh, through the uh, the axons and dendrites and uh, through that uh, find uh, another path to be able to do this. So that is a, a sort of a, a lay person's uh, 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 description of uh, of what this looks like. Um, but that was also supported so by some a, other work. Yep, sorry, go ahead. So as a crude hack, could you... Could you bite a big ice cube and, you know, touch your tongue to it and hold it for a few seconds while learning something or a minute and give that effect? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, what uh, they uh, they actually did uh, in uh, the study, the, the second study, uh, they actually did uh, what you just suggested. Uh, they, uh, they, they looked at both components of the diving, right, the cold water. Uh, as you go uh, deeper, the water gets cold. So they took uh, the same rat uh, and they did this in a stroke model. So uh, they tied off the, the cerebral artery to, uh, to rats and, and, uh, and gave them a stroke uh, and, uh, and then tested both the electrical stimulation of the trigeminal nerve and then the, uh, the cold stimulation. 
the cold did have an effect uh, when they uh, they uh, essentially put cold compresses on the forehead of the uh, of the rats. Uh, the infarct size was reduced by 31 uh, percent. And uh, when they did it electrically uh, through the stimulation of the uh, of the trigeminal nerve directly, the infarct size was reduced by 65 percent. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, gave everybody a little bit of a scientific inkling that uh, th there seems to be something to this uh, trigeminal nerve stimulation. Uh, now, in the, the rats in these studies, these were done invasively by, you know, uh, putting uh, uh, electrodes directly in the brain. Uh, our, our device uh, actually does that uh, by stimulating the tongue non-invasively and, uh, and, uh, and safely. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of cool to be able to piggyback on, uh, on that, uh, that research uh, and, uh, and, uh, and able to, to reproduce uh, those results, uh, we hope, uh, in, uh, in humans <clears throat> based, uh, based on the same principle. Hmm. Okay. Um, so what is the mechanism by which your device induces the neuroplasticity is it based on this or is there another mechanism you found that no we think we think that that's uh yeah richard we think that this is uh this is at the core of at least part of it it doesn't explain everything we see so uh, we're just beginning to uh, to figure this out uh but uh, what we do is we stimulate the tongue uh with a uh, with a, an electrical pulse and it essentially sends 25 million uh, uh pulses to the surface of your tongue uh over a 20 minute period and those uh, those pulses translate to motor neural impulses. So your tongue feels the electricity, and then it sends a signal to the back of your brain through the trigeminal nerve. Uh, and we think that uh, some of the mechanisms that have been uh, elucidated by these scientists uh, is in play. Uh, but there certainly are others uh, because there are other manifestations of what we see that uh, that can't be explained simply by the trigeminal nerve. Um, and uh, in science and in uh, in the healthcare, uh, you know, probably uh, it's a, and it's uh, 50, 60, 70 percent of the the drugs that uh, that uh, are approved for use. We don't really know how they work. We just know that clinically they work, meaning that uh, you know when you take it, it lowers your cholesterol and it uh, and it's safe uh, based on you know studying a whole bunch of people. But exactly the mechanism of how the cholesterol drugs uh, work to uh, reduce cholesterol is not completely known. And it's the same thing on our uh, on our side. I think we have a, a good. Uh, we're beginning to have a good idea. Uh, but and we've tested it clinically, and it does produce these kinds of uh, of improvements. Uh, but to tell you that we know exactly how it works today, uh, again, would be a stretch. Um, have you uh, looked at the work of people that are studying flow states, like Michael Csikszentmihalyi or even Stephen Kotler more recently? They talk about people doing like extreme athletics, and it puts them into a flow state where like the I don't know the blood shunts from the frontal lobe to other places, and they're able to. Yeah perform better than ever and you know would that inform what you're doing uh so uh so interesting that you mentioned that uh we uh we have a, a partnership with a clinical trial site uh in vancouver canada uh where uh they are looking at this uh from a human performance standpoint and uh uh, and we're uh, contemplating doing a study in the flow state and to see whether this would be able to accelerate the flow state uh, in, uh, in, uh, in athletes. Uh, that, uh, that is uh, work that's, uh, that's going to be uh, contemplated uh, in the 2020 timeframe. But uh, yes, uh, the implications of, uh, uh, of this in, uh, in that realm is, uh, is certainly consistent with, uh, with what we've seen on the medical side. So what are some of the um, specific metrics by which your system works better than, you know, conventional physical therapy for people that have traumatic brain injury? Is there less repetitions needed to lock in a new skill? Is it longer lock-in time? Is it lock-in versus yeah. no lock-in? Like what, what happens? Sure. Yeah. So uh, we designed the clinical trial in, uh, in this way. Uh, so... Um, what we did is we took uh, 163 people in two uh, in two trials, and there is a scale called the sensory organization test uh, that is a computerized, completely objective test with a scale of zero to 100. Uh, and uh, if you're 100, you're essentially a, a balance beam uh, athlete, and uh, uh, and you're you've got perfect balance. And at one, basically, it's virtually impossible for you to stand. Most humans uh, who don't have a balance deficit will score about 70 on this scale. Uh, so as we did our trial, uh, we were saying, oh, look, this is uh, physical therapy is the standard of care. 
Uh, and what happens is after you do a certain amount of physical therapy without neuromodulation, you plateau, and you uh, meaning that you don't get better. And so what we did is uh, is we took people, and before they were randomized in the trial, we made sure that they did a full course of physical therapy and to be deemed by their clinician to have plateaued, meaning that they're not going to get any better with doing physical therapy alone. And only after that was reached did we randomize them to the trial. Uh, so, uh, so they were, quote, treatment resistant to further physical therapy. And in that population, we saw uh, a 30-point uh, a rise uh, on this particular scale, and every eight-point rise on that scale is, is called clinically and statistically significant, so, uh, so almost four times higher than you would expect uh, that, that would be noticed by a, uh, by a clinician as, uh, as uh, clinically significant. So uh, that's uh, the basis uh, for which uh, the Canadian regulators have, uh, have cleared our technology in Canada, and it's the same data that we sent to FDA, and they're in the, uh, uh, in the process of reviewing uh, right now. What about, um, okay, so why did you wait till people plateaued? Why not do a group control that just does physical therapy, a group that does nothing at all, a group that does physical therapy along with this uh, neurostimulation? Yep. Uh, also, uh, also a very good question, and it certainly has, uh, has crossed everybody's mind. So, when we were uh, when we were uh, working with FDA early to design the trial, uh, we were really struggling for how to come up with a placebo here. Uh, and because that's how drug trials are done, you sort of compare to a sugar pill, and it gives you a uh, you know the people don't know. In this case, uh, since physical therapy is part of the component, you could imagine, and we we still wanted to make sure that people had. Uh, stopped responding to physical therapy. And so then the, uh, the design issue would be, uh, well, if you're going to be randomized to the group that continues to simply get physical therapy after you've demonstrated that it's not going to work, you're never going to get patients to agree to do that clinical trial for 14 weeks. Um, and the other issue is blinding. Uh, so if you did only physical therapy, would the physical therapists who are performing the trial try as hard? Uh, would the patients uh, think that they're in that arm? Would they also work as hard as the other people? So there is a whole bunch of design flaws that, that come into place. And where we landed with, uh, with FDA is that we would have a, uh, a high-frequency pulse uh, device and a low-frequency pulse device so that uh, the patients would be blinded uh, to uh, and patients and evaluators would be blinded to uh, to the uh, uh, to the treatment, and that way we could get as honest a, a profile as we uh, as we possibly could scientifically. So uh, yes, that would have been uh, very easy, and I think everybody uh, uh, you know an ideal if we could actually design a trial that would allow us to get to that data. But uh, uh, medical devices uh, usually involve some kind of an intervention, and it was uh, impossible to design this trial this way. So what happened in the trial? The people that uh, they exhausted physical therapy, did they yep. continue physical therapy and then include the neurostimulation or they just did neurostimulation, no physical therapy after that? Uh, so what uh, what happened was, uh, so uh, let's say uh, you and I were participating in the trial uh, and uh, and I, I, I would have completed my physical therapy and I'd been deemed that I'm not getting any better. So then I would have uh, had my balance evaluated and I would still have a pretty profound balance disorder. In fact, on average, people that entered the trial had about a level of 40 on that particular scale that I talked to you about. So they were fairly disabled and a prognosis of a lifetime of that disability. So then I would have continued uh, to do physical therapy uh, and add neuromodulation. So add the pawns to the physical therapy. And that's where we saw uh, people uh, within two weeks of treatment have about a 20-point change on this scale when you would expect that there would be zero-point change because they'd already done physical therapy, uh, and, uh, and over a 14-week program have about a 30-point change. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then further, when discontinued uh, all of the treatment, we measured three months later uh, when you would expect that people would have drifted back, and on average, people maintained their benefit for a further three months, uh, suggesting that the brain had permanently changed. Uh, at least we know scientifically for three months, uh, we're going to be gathering a six-month and 12-month data uh, as we uh, as we commercially uh, treat people right now. So that's how the uh, that's how the clinical trial went. Uh, so we were uh, very encouraged by the uh, by the results. Okay, and 
have you identified additional mechanisms beyond the trigeminal nerve stimulation that you think will uh, have a positive effect? Um, we are continuing uh, the, the research. Uh, we are doing uh, what's called the PET scan work. Uh, so that's positive uh, 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 PET. PET, uh, positive emetron. Oh, positron uh, emission medicine. tomography. There you go. Yes, yes. I apologize. I could just slip my mind. Uh, so yeah, we're doing PET studies to be able to see exactly uh, when you stimulate the tongue, where does the stimulation go in the brain? Uh, that study is ongoing right now, and uh, and uh, but we were able to see some of the early images, and it does go into the the motor cortex, so the part that mediates your movement, and so balance. Uh, and it also goes in the pleasure center of the brain or the cingulate cortex, which uh, also is consistent with what we've seen, uh, that people find the sensation pleasurable. Uh, so uh, so we're just at the cutting edge of, uh, of starting to learn these, uh, learn uh, these uh, mechanisms to see what other potential applications uh, for this technology is. But for now, uh, we have done the testing in traumatic brain injury, and uh, and we uh, we'd like to pursue uh, other clinical science to see if we might help people with other neurological conditions as we continue to figure out how this actually works. Yeah, if you if you think about the diving experience, yep. I wonder if you did things like put earphones on people to reduce or eliminate extraneous sound. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe do it in like a float tank or you know just try to emulate yep. the diving experience and see yep. if there's more to that versus just the trigeminal nerve stimulation. No, uh, that uh, that actually, that work, uh, believe it or not, was done by the U.S. Army. Um, it was done back in the in the 2000s. And in fact, it was a, a precursor to uh, to this uh, to this technology. Interestingly, uh, just a couple minutes for the story. So uh, the DARPA, uh, the uh, Special Forces uh, Research Team, um, had a problem with uh, Navy SEALs in that uh, if you swim in a sleep sleep deprived environment, you uh, you tend to go around in circles because you have a dominant side. And so if your task is to go and, uh, and uh, scuba dive uh, in the dark of night uh, and, uh, and put a bomb under a boat, uh, it's really tough to do uh, without uh, doing that. So uh, essentially, the, uh, the same scientists that developed this uh, developed a uh, what they called a, uh, uh, a tongue display unit because the tongue is spatially aware. And they basically said, uh, if uh, if we stimulate right, go right. If we stimulate left, go left. And front and back of the tongue, forwards uh, or up up or down. And they tested the system uh, in exactly that way in these large uh, tanks uh, that uh, were devoid of uh, of light, and uh, the tanks were at 98 degrees, so there was virtually no um, uh, no sensory uh, inputs from everybody else. And uh, and after three hours, uh, the people that were the control group that didn't have the stimulator in their mouth uh, got out and they, uh, you know, like any normal person uh, being subjected to that, had to sit down a little bit uh, for a minute or two and get their balance back and their bearings back. Bearings back. Uh, and uh, the people that had the stimulator uh, walked out perfectly fine. And that was the one of the genesis of the idea that this neuromodulation through the tongue seems to help people preserve balance uh, when they were uh, doing these exercises. And so the idea was, I wonder if this technology uh, might help restore balance in people who have lost it. And that's where the uh, the studies uh, began uh, back in the in the late uh, not years uh, to uh, to determine this, and that's what ultimately yielded where we are today. So uh, interesting that you mentioned that's that. That's great. Well, I, I you know it sounds silly, but I was uh, trying my own experiment while we're doing this interview. I was biting my tongue and putting something <laughs> cold against it to see if I felt anything, just to be why not. Maybe so, that's where uh, all so the just, good ideas came from. I don't know. <laughs> so, so just to, so you know, the uh, the trigeminal nerve uh, it can't be uh, it can only be stimulated uh, electrically through the tongue. Uh, if you were going to stimulate the trigeminal nerve uh, through a cold compress, you actually have to do it on your temples because that's where the branch of the trigeminal uh, nerve is at a proximity to uh, uh, to your skin uh, that would actually yield that, uh, that. So that's what happens in the diving reflex. It's the cold that hits the uh, the forehead of the mammal uh, and uh, that seems to cause the same uh, the same issue. And, and just physiologically, what happens is is your uh, your uh, the blood flow to the periphery of your body uh, stops and your vital organs are primed. So blood goes to your heart, to your head, to your kidneys, 
uh, and your spleen just pumps more blood to that uh, to that area. So it's a it's a little bit of the fight or flight uh, uh, kind of, uh, of of system uh, also. So uh, um, so it's it's all really interesting, uh, all really interesting science that we're continuing to pursue on a parallel path. Uh, like I said, so we uh, we get to learn how this uh, this really works. Okay, and then uh, last question or two: How can mm-hmm. people with a a problem, you know, traumatic brain injury, traumatic brain injury, and inability to walk and navigate properly get access to this? Do they need a prescription? Is it available widely, or is it just a few spots? Sure. So in the U.S., it's still an experimental device. It's not been cleared by uh, by FDA. Uh, in Canada, it was cleared back in uh, in October of last year, and uh, and so there are a few clinics in Canada. I know that's not practical for Americans. Many people with traumatic brain injury and have a balance uh, balance issue uh, actually can't travel or struggle with traveling. Uh, so we're uh, hopeful here that uh, that FDA we submitted to FDA in uh, late August and uh, uh, and. Uh, Back in January, FDA asked us uh, some additional questions, which we've now responded. So the uh, the ball is back uh, back in their court, and we're hoping to hear from them soon uh, uh, on uh, on whether they are going to clear the device uh, here. Once that's done, uh, people will be able to uh, go to uh, large neuro rehabilitation clinics that we're in the process of building relationships with, uh, so that they can essentially buy the treatment program. Uh, to, uh, to 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 be treated for uh, for their disorder. So that's uh, ultimately how this is going to be deployed. Uh, but as I said, in the U.S., um, we're uh, we're not cleared yet. So unfortunately, it's not available in the U.S. yet. All right. Well, very good. So, what's the best way for folks to get in contact, ask questions, suggest collaboration, you know, any, et cetera? Oh. It's- Certainly, they uh, they can uh, go to our website at heliusmedical.com, dot uh, com, and there is a uh, question and forum uh, area there that they could uh, drop questions off. Uh, also, uh, very happy to uh, to give people my email address uh, if they want to uh, uh, to go. So it's uh, p deschamps uh, deschamps so d e s c h a m p s at heliusmedical.com. dot com. Uh, and uh, happy to receive uh, emails uh, with questions, and uh, and we try to answer uh, all the questions that uh, that come through. And uh, and as I said, we're uh, looking forward to uh, to uh, to make this available in the U.S. Uh, as soon as we uh, finish our, our our discussions with FDA. That's great. Well, cool. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure, Richard. Uh, all the best to you. Bye now. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.